good evening everyone and uh, i welcome you all to this uh, lecture theater greetings from tifr alumni association and all the guests who are also joining from the uh, internet on the zoom so my name is shri ganesh prabhu and uh, i am the secretary of the tifr alumni association it's a great pleasure for me to invite you all to this fourth avik guha lecture i am especially delighted to welcome our speaker uh, professor sudhir jain uh vice chancellor banaras hindu university and we hope to learn exciting perspectives through his talk today uh before we start the proceedings as a safety precautions may i please request all of you to switch off your mobile or keep them in silent mode so that we don't have any disturbance uh so also i would like to invite you for the uh, high tea after the lecture and then you where you can also interact with the speaker now i request our president to formally welcome professor jain to director tifr so thank you professor chengulur for gracing this occasion and now i require request professor mayank waya president uh, of the ti for alumni association to speak about the association and specifically the avi guha lecture and introduce the, our speaker professor waya thank you very much uh, prabhu ji it's a pleasure to be here as um, alumni association president after having spent what 40 odd years so the alumni association has been set up in tifr to keep um, the alumni basically in touch with alumni and keep in contact with alumni we recently had in december that event called landmarks in tifr and the idea is to keep um, keep in touch and keep uh, in contact with um, alumni um, apart from that of course alumni association would also like to help tifr faculty and students to the extent it can uh because tfr is a great institution it is a, it is one of those unique institutions where you have freedom like you have practically nowhere else in the world where you don't need to have the pressure of teaching and you can do research in almost anything that you like to do and that's what makes this institution the great place that it is uh so it's always a pleasure to be back to the alma mater as far as um, the lecture today is concerned uh, professor sudhir jain is here uh, in i first met him in uh, what 2009 when he became director of the iit gandhinagar and he was looking for interesting exciting programs that could be started at iit gandhinagar which eventually resulted in starting one of the most uh, fascinating schools in archaeology and ancient indian sciences at iit gandhinagar and then of course he went on to establish an iit that didn't exist at that time stabilized it created its infrastructure created its entire structure and today iit gandhinagar is amongst the great iits of india um and after that um, the government called upon him to stabilize the banaras hindu university so now he's the vice chancellor at banaras hindu university uh so this, um, sudhir jain was born in 1959 and he got, got his degree originally from um, he, he got his bachelor from roorkee and then his masters uh, from caltech uh, and then he decided to return to india um, for originally to iit kharagpur and then went on to become iit gandhinagar director uh, his expertise is on um, on earthquakes and related issues so he's a fellow of several engineering institutions in india and the world and i hardly need to list them out for 13 years like i said he was director of um, iit gandhinagar and now since last year i think almost to the day to the month he has become direct uh, vice chancellor of banaras hindu university he is a fellow of all major academies of engineering in the country he was also the president of the earthquake engineering international body association for earthquake engineering so that is the level of his expertise um at caltech but he has decided to devote his time to institution building in india and iit gandhinagar is a shining example of what he has achieved and we um, now bhu stands to gain a lot from what he has among the things that he has done which interested us the most is that he has managed to gather 
for various institutions, a kind of um, independent corpus which can help in informal ways in many, many, uh, many, many activities of the institution that he is going to talk. He has been associated with and he has advised. And today we have called him to seek his advice about how we can create such a corpus and such an infrastructure for TFR so that we can help our students and we can help our faculty to go beyond what they go right now. So with those expectations, we have requested Dr. Avi Guha to come here and we are very grateful to him that he has accepted our invitation. And he's going to talk about academic excellence uh, and the role of alumni and external engagement, the importance of external engagement, the importance of um, alumni, and of course, to the larger betterment of this institution. So with those few words, I would like to doctor, invite Dr. Jain to give the lecture. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Professor Vahia. Thank you, uh, Professor Prabhu, Director, and for <clears throat> this opportunity to share uh, some of my thoughts on alumni relations, external engagement. Uh, as I will tell you in the middle of this presentation, I got accidentally drawn into this line of work. I was like any other teacher, uh, busy with my teaching classes and uh, guiding some students, writing a few papers, doing some consulting. Uh, at one time, uh, after three or four years of Kanpur IIT, I happened to go to Bihar after an earthquake in 1988. I joined IIT Kanpur in 1984 as a faculty. 88, I went to uh, Bihar after an earthquake that had killed uh, more than 1,000 people in Bihar and a larger number in Nepal. And I came back as a transformed person and my life's mission was to save Indians and other people in developing countries from earthquakes. My simple logic was that an earthquake that kills only 50 people or 100 people in California, similar size earthquake kills 10,000 people, 20,000 people, 5,000 people in India, and that need not happen. Uh, they are not killing because earthquakes are uh, big, but because we are not doing the safe construction. And that became my life's mission and life's passion. Uh, uh, how do we save human uh, lives in case of an earthquake. In fact, uh, for 25 years, uh, from 1984, it, it was the formal induction into this uh, mission. But uh, practically until I went to uh, Gandhinagar in 2009, uh, I only saw earthquake safety. Nothing else imp was important to me. Uh, but life has its own twists and turns. You don't know where you will end up uh, next moment. And as you will see, I accidentally uh, went into fundraising, alumni relations, and things like that, and slowly, uh, entirely new uh, 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 set of uh, priorities, set of ideas started uh, come to me. Uh, to me, what makes a great institution has just three things. You get top talent, and there's no definition of top. There is no top. Uh, you can always do better. If you go to Caltech, where I used to go more often uh, when I was at Kantur, uh, they will always lament that they are trying to find, they have a faculty search open, they are trying to find somebody. And if Caltech was saying, we are trying to find somebody, I mean, you can imagine, uh, they were not happy. Uh, they thought there should be more talent outside or better talent outside, right? There's no limit to top talent. Uh, generous resources. You need tons of money. You need tons of resources, buildings, labs, equipments, things like that to do some really good academic work. But I, I believe that the most important thing, especially in Indian context that we never or almost rarely talk about is the good governance and the cultural system. And that is where institutions like TIFR have trumped over other institutions by maintaining a strong culture and strong governance systems. But I think there's a lot to be improved and a lot to be done. Uh, the point is all three are very well connected. If you have top talent, it is easier to build good governance system. If you have good governance system, it is easier to uh, get more resources or get better uh, teachers to join in. Uh, why do you need money? You need money because academic excellence is very, very expensive. Just now I was talking and saying that uh, 50 years back, 75 years back, uh, India could think about bringing uh, people like Einstein uh, to India to teach or whatever. You know, uh, I'm now at Banaras Hindu University and there is a famous letter that Madan Mohan Malviya ji wrote to uh, um, Einstein uh, asking him to join, you know, that kind of thing. So there were, there were 
aspirations and uh, neil bohr for example and people like those would come to india and rub shoulders with our colleagues the question is how many nobel laureates we can today in good conscience expect that they would come and work in india with us and rub shoulders with us it's expensive but more importantly to my mind it gives a lot of flexibility and autonomy because with every common grant there are certain limitations how much the salary you can give to somebody if you have to give phd scholarship you there are certain conditions under which you can give phd scholarship but you may have a scholar that you want to support and who is not meeting those criteria so you need those flexibilities those autonomies you need accountability now the way the government system works is that they are accountable to the extent of following the gfr the government financial rules whatever systems the way the government says is that this chair that you bought but they bought with the right process but if these chairs were given by a donor he will say i gave these chairs to you do you ever use them in what way these chairs have helped tifr to push its agenda so the kind of quality of uh, accountability you get with the donor money is a order of magnitude of a different kind but i think finally the most important thing is that you get lot of critical inputs and support when somebody is giving you money they become like shareholders of your company now they are going to watch out for you they are going to worry about you they are going to come and bother you if they think that you are not doing well but they will also support you when you need support and to me that is also a very very important thing and i'll show you some examples of how we are able to achieve some of these things uh, in iit kanpur uh as i mentioned to you i accidentally uh, went into the fundraising business uh, it was around 1997 that uh, i decided that iit kanpur iit kanpur should have a so called information center and the mission was that any textbook any research report any literature on earthquake engineering at least one copy should be available in india and anybody in india should be able to use it so i wrote up a proposal and i said i need 10 lakh rupees to buy books and publications and journals and whatever every year and i need another 5 lakh rupees to operate that whole machine and for that i need 1 and 1/2 crore rupees endowment and with my bag i started to go to delhi and try to find some secretaries some uh, senior officers walk into their office with prior appointment sometimes without prior appointment sometimes through connections and trying to persuade them that india has a earthquake problem and please give me some money that's it the first check came in 1999 2001 came the big earthquake and even though the money we had in 2001 uh, was relatively very small but we our hands were forced we had to immediately uh, start the activities of information center so we started to build it today i am very proud of saying that i have been away now from iit kanpur for almost 13 and a half years uh, the center works very uh, vibrantly it gets absolutely not a single rupee from iit kanpur administration or from the budgetary support we have an endowment of 2.6 crore rupees today and we have a budget of 30 to 40 lakh rupees a year uh, some of it comes from sales or publications fee things like that and it's a totally self supported it has staff it has a senior uh, officer working with it for last 13 years and that's a fine example of what you can do with private money well it was not exactly very private Uh, some money came from hudco some came from railway ministry like that because i was going to different people and asking them in 2005 i took over as dean for resource planning and generation i was offered this job in 1999 and i said forget it i don't want to do it i am an academic and it's not my job i don't want to be raising money uh, the director was quite persuasive but i think i was also quite stubborn i was much younger i would not have been as stubborn as i was at the time 99 i refused uh, absolutely uh, but 2005 i just could not do it the director walked into my office that is the only time in 25 years that an iit kanpur director walked into my office and said close the door and <laughs> i am not leaving till you say yes kind of situation all right so 2005 january i had to take this new responsibility this responsibility had been created after uh, the government said to iits you should start to raise money uh, that was around 1994 so they said formally to it is that create an endowment start to raise money uh, so before me there were three or four uh, deans that had held that position i had no clue how to raise money although i had been going to delhi 
uh, asking for money. I had been writing emails. I had been making phone calls, but still I had no clue to what it is. So uh, I said, I have to learn it. If I have to do something, I have to learn it. So I sought uh, through my friends, well-wishers, appointments with the fundraising offices at two private universities in US, uh, Johns Hopkins and Caltech, and two public universities, UCLA and UC Berkeley, because I thought private and public, there would be a little bit of different nuances of fundraising. I went there, sat there uh, like a student with a letterhead, with a pen, and I said, teach me how the fundraising happens. During those three years, I learned from some university leaders. I learned from some of the IIT Kanpur alumni who were senior uh, people, potentially donors who were giving money to their alma mater in the United States. The tragedy was that our IIT Kanpur alumni were giving large monies to American universities, and we at IIT Kanpur were never asking them for money. So they were very happy when I started to ask money, and they were very happy to mentor me and help me and teach me how I should be asking them money. Over three years at IIT Kanpur, I started to actually ask money for the first time. I was the first person in IIT Kanpur to say, I will ask money. Until that time, we were a little shy. Somebody will come, give money, very nice. We will take it. But here I was blatantly saying, give me money. Uh, I think I take credit for that. In three years, we set up 29 faculty chairs. Before me, in seven years, there were two chairs. We set up 65 endowed scholarships. It was a three years or a fantastic experience for me for various reasons. Not only that I was raising money, but I was now looking at IIT Kanpur from a different lens. I was trying to see what improvement IIT Kanpur can have because money doesn't come without improvement. Money comes with certain accountability. Right? And in the process, I was making friends. I was making uh, meeting people, very eminent people, very successful people. I was learning from them. I was growing as a person. I was making friends with them. Uh, as a, at a personal level, it was a very, very enriching period of three years. In fact, at the end of my tenure, I wrote four pages of a little report, which I sent out to all the alumni saying, this is what happened in three years. And that is available uh, if somebody is interested to see the range of activities in which I was involved in for three years. Uh, this is the graph from that report that we were doubling the number of donors every year kind of thing. Uh, I joined IIT Kandiga in June 2009. By the time I had a hang of the fundraising, uh, same month we had friends in the United States who filed a foundation in the United States. The idea is that Indian alumni are less likely to give money because they are not trained to give money. They think that it is a government-supported institution. Why should we take give our money? On the other side, our Indians living in the United States, they get hammered by their American institution all the time, and they are uh, quite used to giving money. So typically, most institutions are finding it easier uh, to, for example, persuade US-based alumni to give money. That will not be so easy with Europe. Europe doesn't do that uh, such a good job. So the important thing was, can we create a foundation in the United States? so that the American, uh, America-based uh, donor will give money not to IIT Kandiga, but to that foundation and claim tax exemption. And now this Kandiga Foundation will give money to IIT Kandiga. So we filed the same, filed the uh, foundation same month. By end of 2009, we had tax exemption. By the way, it took me three years to get, get tax exemption from Indian government, uh, but it took me only four months to get it in the United States. Right? Uh, we had no alumni. Uh, when I went there, there were 90 first year students, uh, but we needed to raise money. Uh, we reached out to alumni of older IITs. Primarily, they were excited that there was something exciting happening at IIT Kandiga, which they wish their alma mater, that older IIT would be. That was the most exciting uh, uh, thing that motivated many of them to join us. We also uh, appealed to the Gujarati pride, saying this is a IIT in Gujarat, you need to support us. Uh, we went to companies. We were very lucky to get some money from US-based companies, Japan-based company. The one company gave us large money. And anybody else who would give us money, we will take it. Right. Uh, this is a graph, the money that I raised at IIT Gandhinagar and gives you uh, uh, segments. Uh, the red line shows you that initial uh, three years, it was like average of like 40 lakh rupees a year. Then the slope improved to like three and a half crore rupees a year. And then the slope further increased to like 12 and a half crore rupees a year. 
and I left IIT Gandhagar in January 2023, uh, no, sorry, January 22. And uh, people used to say, what will happen to IIT Gandhagar because you are raising money. That, but I had trained people, we had built systems, and I'm extremely proud that this year IIT Gandhagar has already raised 23 crore rupees, almost double of what I used to do. Uh, and I take great pride. I take great pride that uh, the system I left behind is not only effective, but it is becoming vibrant and more effective, right? Over the years, you can see we have raised almost 115 crore rupees of philanthropic money. Uh, this 25 crore rupees, you can imagine, is about the ballpark number that government of India gives us under what is called OH31, the non-salary, non-equipment uh, budget. So it is of that order. I don't remember what is the right number these days. It might not be 25 crore, it may be 30 crore, it might be 22 crore, I don't know the number. But it is ballpark the same number. It's a huge impact that it will have. I'll show you some examples of what we are able to do with this. When I went to America to learn fundraising, I realized that it's a very sophisticated subject. It's no longer Sudhir Jain going around making asking for money. The professionals now trained for fundraising. There is a professional society where university fundraising office bearers actually become professional members. Like you become a member of the Indian Physics Society. They become members of CASE. In fact, I became a member of CASE, uh, of this organization. During my three years, I paid them $700 or some <laughs> membership fee. I said, I am a member. <laughs> I became a member of this society. They were journal. They were professional journal. They have uh, conferences. They will do big conferences where people from all over the United States and elsewhere will come, share their experiences, present their papers, share best practices. Uh, they have standards. What are the do's and don'ts in fundraising? So it's a very, very sophisticated subject. When I went to America to learn fundraising in 2005, they said, look, good old days, the typical vice president of alumni relations and development used to be a university professor, not any longer. Now there are real professionals who are now vice president for alumni relations and development. Uh, in India, obviously, you will not find such people. You will have to continue with professors doing that. That is what I did at IIT Kandar. Who are the potential donors? It is a mistake to think that alumni are the only donors. Anybody who has goodwill for the university, for the college, can be a potential donor. It can be parents. It can be former faculty, current faculty, friends of the institute, foundations, industry. As you, as, I, as you saw, at IIT Gandhagar, there were no alumni, and our alumni started to come out only in 2012. How much money can a young boy or girl give when he or she is in his first year of job? 2,000 rupees. Why would somebody give money? Primarily because it feels good to be part of a good initiative. If you are doing something worthwhile, if you are doing something good, I want to be part of that. If TIFR is doing something good, can Sudhir Jain get some credit for it by giving some money? That's the spirit. Can I be part of you if you are doing something good? Which means now it starts to improve your governance system. It starts to improve your own systems. Recognition. I want to be able to tell people that, ah, I gave money. IIT Kanpur. I want to be able to show the poster, the pamphlet, the name on the auditorium for which I gave five crore rupees. Recognition. And finally, some people feel debt to the alma mater. They feel very, very deeply grateful to the college that made them what they are. And regardless of how badly the college treats them, they give money. I know one gentleman of one of the old IITs, uh, personally met him. His friends tell me that uh, the alma mater hasn't been always treating him well. And we keep complaining to our friend, why are you giving money? He says, yaar, apna college hai, yaar, isne hume paida kiya hai, yaar, chanta na kar, koi nahi, no problem. Has given millions of dollars. Right? So they give money also for debt. But the deal is, nobody gives money on its own. Very rarely, the third type of person comes across who will say, Bhaiya, pusse paise le le. Very rarely. Most of the time, the university has to ask for it. That brings us to the donor stewardship, the relationship building. When I joined 
as a dean uh, at Kanpur IIT, one of the senior alumni based in United States, who had been very unhappy with the IIT Kanpur's way of dealing with alumni affairs. He said, Sudhir, can you just make sure there is communication? And trust me, bad communication is better than no communication. So I took that as a very, very important lesson in my life that at least in this business, it is okay to write a stupid email, but make sure that you write email. You will need regular one-to-one -one meeting with major donors. Even if you know that this person is never going to give you more money, he has already given you $2 million, $1 million, you still need to cultivate because he or she is sharing their experience with other people. So my rule was that if anybody in the United States has given me $100,000 or more, I must go and meet them in person once a year. Mr. Narayan Murthy was one of our largest donors. Three years, I, would, I have gone to three times to his office after a fixing appointment. I've flown into Bangalore, gone to meet him for one hour, told him what we are doing so that he feels comfortable with it. You need to create very strong reporting system for accounts and activity. You gave us this money. This is what we did with this money. These are the activities that we did. If somebody has given you scholarship money, you have to say, this is the money you gave us. This much is the interest we earned. This is the money that we gave to the student. This is what it is at the balance. And by the way, this scholarship was given to such a student who is a third year student of BTEC, whatever electrical engineering, and also attach a letter of appreciation, letter of thanks from that student so that the family will feel nice that we gave money. 10 years back, my grandfather gave money 20 years back. That's nice. You need to have lots of letters, emails, newsletters. You need to showcase how donation is making a difference. You need to give them more credit than what they deserve. Don't say, okay, we use, we build this auditorium with 25% money from the alumni. You say, we build this auditorium, it was possible because of the alumni donation, even though they gave only 25%. Right? And recognize and acknowledge. And one of the important things I learned was that we are very poor in writing spellings. And nothing bothers a donor if your spelling is wrong. So I had a class one officer working for me. He wrote an email to one of our donor, dear Mr. Something like Sunil Singhal, thank you very much for your donation of 10,000 rupees. Right? And this guy wrote me a very nasty email. He said, your officer. He said, I heard from you that you are trying to professionalize, you are trying to improve things, but I don't see any hope for you if this is the kind of officer working for you. He got my name wrong and he got my amount wrong. He, got, he had given us 1 lakh rupees and my officer had written to hey, zero. Kya hai? Koma to lagate nahi. Zero lagate mein ho jata hai. Uh, I had another donor who gave me uh, 1 lakh dollar very easily, US based. We had an annual report published, 40 page, 50 page, uh, very uh, nicely uh, published report. And we wrote his name. Uh, his name was something like Gurmukh. So at one place we wrote G U R M U K H, but at another place we wrote G U R U M U H, M U K. So there was a U Lafla, Yutha Ekjaga Uni. I forget his name was you or without, with you or without you. Gurmukh can be with you or without you. And he wrote back to me, he said, I'm saddened that I gave you $100,000 and you can't even write my name correctly. Right? I reprinted that whole thing, sent 25 copies to him. And I said, my apologies. Uh, I can't redo the 10,000 copies that I've sent to everybody, but here are 25 copies in case you wish to share with your family and friends. I learned my lesson. You have to be very, very careful when you communicate with any donor. They have given their very, very affectionate gesture to you. You at least deserve they at least deserve to have the right name. Now, one of the things that when I took office at IIT Kanpur was confusion about alumni and alumni affairs. And I'm very clear about that. There are two different players. One is the institute, the university, the college, which is interested in building relationship with the alumni. And there's a totally different entity called alumni association which is the association of alumni. These are two different entities. And we must always be clear about the alumni association and the institute's effort for alumni relations. Quite often in our universities, we outsource the work of alumni relations 
to alumni association. That's not a very healthy practice. Because that leads to power games, that leads to conflicts, that leads to very, very unpleasant things. I know of at least one IIT where there is now court cases going on between IIT and the alumni association. Right? Now, what does an alumni association do? Alumni association is a bunch of alumni who got together. That's it. And why do they got together? Because they found memories of the college. They want to socialize. They want to have parties. They want to have a picnic. They want to meet each other with families. They want to also help each other. Nothing to do with helping the college. They want to just have fun. At Ahmedabad, there was a very vibrant Rudki association where we used to have parties, picnics, get-togethers. And we all shared Rudki connection. We can also have alumni association mobilize support for alma mater. They may say, let's help college. College has given us this. Let's all help us. And finally, contribute to society by collective action. I'm an alum of Rudki. I'm very passionate about blind people. In my next get together at picnic, I say, guys, I'm doing this for blind people. Would some of you come along? Maybe some people will come along. And I'm now able to multiply my force for collective action thanks to my connection with my alumni association, alumni friends. This is what the alumni association is all about. There are three types of alumni association that you can think about. One is totally independent. It's a different legal body. It does its business. You do your business. If there is something in common, you do it together. But there is no obligation on either side. We are fair weather friends. If there is some opportunity to collaborate, if there is some opportunity to do things together, we will do it. But you don't owe me anything, I don't owe you anything. The second one is interdependent, where it is legally a separate body, but there is a dependence on each other. The IIT Kanpur says to the alumni association, help us do this. And we will give you the office. We will give you the staff. And alumni association will say, we want to create our newsletter. It's too expensive for us to hire a person who will make our newsletter. Let the newsletter be created by the publications office of IIT. Things like that. There is now an agreement, written agreement or unwritten agreement of understanding between the two organizations, what they will or will not collaborate. The third is a totally dependent model where actually there is no legal body even. So, for example, in IIT Gandhagar till now, it is the third model because we were too small. We didn't expect our alumni who are just getting out, get, trying to stabilize in the job, getting married, things like that, to now bother about creating an alumni association. So, we said, fine, we'll operate it from here. But we didn't call it alumni association. We call it alumni relations and we left it a little bit vague between association and relations. Well, if you want to raise money from alumni, the first and foremost question is, have you treated your students well? Because if your students have not been treated well, they are not going to give you even 100 rupees. They are going to carry the stigma. They are going to carry the scars of you having mistreated. You need to build alumni relations. You need to build goodwill. To build goodwill, it costs money. So yesterday, I was at ISC Bangalore for a lecture at ISC Bangalore. IIT Gandhinagar said, Professor Sudhir Jain is coming on Sunday at Koramangala Club. From 6 o'clock, we will have an alumni get together. 180 people showed up. Right? IIT Kanaga flew in. The professor dealing with alumni relations, one of the staff members who is dealing with the alumni relations office, paid the bill for food for 180 people, Koramangala charges, this, that. Right? And when we did that event, Professor Ashok Mishra was director of IIT Bombay. He said, hey, I'm happy to join. He joined. Then one of the startup, a very successful startup guy, Naveen Tiwari, he came. And we had a good conversation, good discussion. And after dinner, everything got over. No money exchanged. IIT Gandhi spent money. Right? So the alumni relations work is to build goodwill. The entire activity was about building goodwill. And it costs money. During my time at Kanpur IIT, if I'm going to Calcutta for an event, 
I would call an alumni, alumni person in Calcutta. I will be in Calcutta for a meeting. Do you think we can put together something? He said, yeah, Bengal club mein kuch kar dete hai. I said, I will pay. Fine, you pay. IT can't do it. Right? So 100 people get together, some food, alcohol, this, that, right? At the end of it, there's going to be a fat bill. And I look at the host who has organized it. I said, how much is it? Don't worry, I'll pay. Right? It sometimes happens that they will say, all right, we will pay. But you have to be ready to spend money on it. The second level is alumni giving, annual giving. You have to ask money from everybody. You cannot single out the rich people because that is discrimination. You have to ask everybody, doesn't matter how well or not well they are doing. And there is no lower limit to how much you can take, 100 rupees, no problem. So at IIT Kandaga, I used to say, Ek dinner ka paisa de do. to my bacha alumni, you know, they're just graduating, they're just struggling. Ek, ek dinner ka paisa de do. This builds the pipeline, this creates the mahal, this creates the environment for raising money. But remember, this is costly. You have to make phone calls, you have to keep track of who gave money, you have to write thank you letters, and so on and so forth. You need staff time, you need communication and things like that. It does cost money. You have to pray letters, maybe send it out. So annual giving costs money, maybe 20%, maybe 30%, maybe 25% of what you will raise, you will spend on raising this money. And finally, the third is uh, large gifts, scholarships, endowed lectures, uh, buildings, chairs, and all that stuff. When I went to the four fundraising offices, every office drew this triangle for me. This is a standard, gold standard of fundraising. Don't compromise on this. Here is a pyramid. You need a very wide base if you want to go high. You cannot have a very high pyramid, but with a very narrow base, which means you have to have very wide alumni relations. Lot of people should be on your system, receiving communications, engaging with them in some way or the other. Out of that, some people will give you annual money. 100 rupees, 1000 rupees, 1 lakh rupees. And out of that, still very small number of people will give you very large money. What everybody taught me was that it is very stupid to think that you can only do this and get away with this. That's not, doesn't work. Let me show you some quick data. In one particular year, 2006-2007, I analyzed the data at IIT Kanpur. 8% of our donors had given only 7% money. And 80% money had come from 6% donors. So the top that you are getting money is very few people, but what the basics of fundraising taught me was that top will not happen if you don't do the bottom two layers. For alumni relations, you first have to have a database. You should know who are your alumni, where are they. In the United States, there is a saying that your family may not know where you are, but university will know where you are. They will never let you go. In 2005, there were, there were services I could pay so many cents per name that I could put a name of Mayank Vahia and it will locate all the Mayank Vahiyas that are there in the United States, their addresses and whatever information is publicly information available. And that is how they will build their database, their services. In 2005, when the artificial intelligence, machine learning, all that stuff was uh, not even talked about. Right? So firstly, you need a database. You need to know. Granularity. If you know that this person was passionate about football and your students are interested in football, it's an interesting thing, right? The person comes to you and you say, you know, our students are thinking of uh, creating this football, this thing, and he was more likely to give money for football than for auditorium. You need to have communication channels, lots of get-togethers, things. You have to develop engagement mechanisms other than asking for donations. You don't always ask for money. You don't look at them as a source of money all the time. And finally, you have to manage your good relationship with alumni association because I know many academic institutions in India as well as in US where there's a lot of tension between the university and the alumni association. That's a very important thing. Just to give a sense to you, 
this annual giving is a very good indicator of the student satisfaction. How happy the students were is a very good reflection through the annual giving. And US News, which is a rating agency that Americans follow quite often, they use this as a parameter for evaluating which university is better, one of the parameters. If you get more percentage of alumni, not the amount, so it can be $1, it can be $10, uh, you're supposed to be better. In US, I'm told that about 8% alumni donate every year, but there are colleges which do extremely well. Princeton hits at 55%, MIT hits at 35%. Uh, my guess is that they are undergraduate students. Undergraduates tend to be more loyal to the college than the PhD students because they come at a very tender age. That is where they go from childhood to adulthood and things like that. At IIT Gandhi, we were very particular that we wanted to build this pipeline in a very robust way. And we said, we will not distinguish between undergraduates and postgraduates and we'll chase postgraduates. And I'll tell you what we do for postgraduates, the kind of pampering we do to postgraduates. And as a result, we are hitting 50% uh, for last several years. Average donation is only 4,000 rupees. Median is only 2,000 rupees. But we think that this is very, and if you add it up, it's very small money. It's less than 2% of what we will raise otherwise. But for us, it is very important. Uh, just graph, uh, just to show these numbers, this I've told you already. That is uh, to be kept in mind is that quite often in Indian institutions, we try to follow what Americans do. That's not a good idea. You need to understand your own situation. If you go to Caltech or if you go to MIT, uh, they will say, can you give us a building? And today at lunchtime, I was talking to a couple of colleagues here. And I was saying that in India, the government is very happy to give you money for buildings, but they will not give you money to double the salary of your faculty. So why should you ask money for buildings when there is a good chance that by making a few phone calls to the secretary and the financial advisor, you can get perhaps more money for making buildings. So my rule at IIT Ganega was never to ask money for buildings. But I can name the building. So if somebody is very keen on a building, I'll say here is this auditorium. How about you give me five crore rupees and I put your daddy's name on it. And my agreement would say, this gentleman or foundation or this lady has given five crore rupees as an affection, as a part, you know, to show her affection to the institute, which will be created, which will be an endowment that IIT Ganega will use for supporting excellence as per its internal policies from time to time by the board of governors. And second line will say, as a gesture of goodwill, IIT Ganega will name auditorium as such and such. Right? So now there is no money going to make that auditorium. The auditorium is being built with the government money, and I'm doing the advertisement rights, if you like, for uh, the donor. Quite often in India, people get confused. When I first time did this, I got an email from the ministry. Uh, we were naming an auditorium for five crore rupees. And the ministry, somebody asked a question, how much did it cost to build that? Because somebody in ministry said, ka auditorium hai, tu crore mein de hai, saste mein bech hai, yaar. Nahin chale hai, mera to crore khach ki hai, BCA nahin chale. Usko auditorium de nahi raho, leke nahi ja raha hai apne saath. He is not taking the auditorium with him. He doesn't even have right to come into the auditorium without your permission. He is only being given advertisement rights. Right? So that was a good learning experience for me. I said, I don't want to be in a situation in future where I will have a negotiation and somebody in the ministry will ask me a question, how much is the cost of this? So we took a policy decision at the board level. We said the naming of the uh, may vary depending on the value of that asset. If it is a hostel, it's not so valuable as a library. Imagine Mank Vahia hostel or Mank Vahia library. Which one is more value for Mank Vahia family? Obviously the library. So library may be 10 crore rupees, I may ask 50 crore rupees for its name. And hostel may be 50 crore rupees, and I may be happy to name it for 10 crore rupees. So there is no direct connection. What we did was, we actually went to the board and we created a menu card, and we said, for this classroom, we will ask for this much money. For chalk, we will ask for this money. For this road, we will ask for this money. For this terrace, we will ask for this money. For health center, so much money. Library, so much money, and so on and so forth. We created a menu card, and board said, if the director is taking any donation of this much or more, he doesn't need to worry about it. So that enabled me to go to any donor and say, all right, you want to give me two crore rupees, I will name this laboratory. 
that was one of the very, very useful thing for us. We also need to sometimes leverage other funds. Sometimes the donor says, I will give you 5 crore rupees, but can you put in 5 crore rupees? Because he wants the value of his donor to be, donation to be multiplied. And that is where it helps in IT system allowed to keep the tuition fee and some of our internal incomes if they are left over as our corpus, as our internal money. And our board is allowed to use that. So in our <coughs> case, we said anybody giving us a 10 lakh rupees for scholarship, IT Gandhi will put 10 lakh more. So now a donor comes to me and I say, you know, give me 10, but I will create a scholarship worth 20 lakh rupees in your mother's name. It's interesting. Uh, it happened in several cases. We were asking for shares of 1.2 crore rupees and donor said, I have $100,000 budget. In $100,000, create a lecture series for me. And we said, yeah, lecture, we don't have fun. Share it, right? It's 1.2 crore. He said, yeah, but 100,000, let's say, some of us, 75 lakh rupees. He says, yeah, but I don't want to give you 1.2 crore rupees. I can only give you 75 lakh rupees. I said, don't worry, 45, I'm like. Right? And in the process, we were able to bring several chairs like this, where donor gave us 75 lakh rupees, and we brought in 45 lakh rupees from the internal money that IIT Kandigar has. Things like that. So you have to be a little bit flexible. You have to be a little bit creative in things like this. Singapore government had a very interesting system. If you search on the internet, you will be able to find it. I don't remember exact details. They said, uh, this is, I'm talking about 20 years back, or 25 years back. They said, up to such and such year, every dollar somebody gives to a university, Singapore government will give two and a half dollars. After that date, for up to this date, every time a donor will give one dollar, Singapore government will give, let's say, one dollar, one and a half dollar. I don't remember exact numbers. The idea was for universities to go out and get money. Because Singapore, like India, used to have a government-owned, government-managed universities, and they said, we can't go if we don't loosen up our control on the university. So they made them what they call as corporations or independent entities, and they said, raise money. Donations for what? I remember at one place, I went and somebody said, our faculty housing is very poor. We want to improve the faculty housing. Therefore, we need donations. Doesn't work. Negativity doesn't bring money. Don't ever say that, okay, my toilets are not clean. And if you give me money, your toilets will be clean. That doesn't work. But if you say my toilets are clean, but I want to make them five-star toilets, you have a chance. Improvement for excellence is okay. But improvement for pathetic situation is not okay. You have to ask for something exciting, something that will make the person proud. There are also some donors who are very interested in social things. They say, yeah, it's a country. You guys are air-conditioned office. What's the poor man? So you need also some activities because you don't want any donor to go sick. You want every donor to leave, leave his money or her money at your college, which means that you need to have some underprivileged sections proposals. You need to say about daily wagers. They outsource staff. They have medical emergencies sometimes. There is an insurance scheme, ESIC, that doesn't always work. They run into sometimes large um, you know, bills. Uh, can we create a workers' welfare fund from where we will give them money? Ah, so if I'm kind-hearted, want to work at the bottom of the pyramid, poor people, I will give money for that. Like that. <clears throat> now this I've already uh, talked to you about. In my view, it's not, it's a loss of opportunity to ask money for uh, capital projects in India. It doesn't work. In America, they need money for buildings, but not in India. I'll just give you a few slides of what we were able to do at IIT Gandhigar that perhaps most of the IITs would not be able to do. 40% of our undergraduates are going outside India for summer research fully paid. 40%, year after year. 40% of our students going, were going on a what is called Explorer Fellowship every year, which means experience India on a very low budget, length and breadth of India, learn how poor people in India live on a very low budget. We were giving very liberal scholarships and financial support. I remember a student wrote us saying that my mother is hospitalized and I need 50,000 rupees. We actually gave that student 50,000 rupees because his mother is in the hospital. A student came to us in first year said, my artificial leg needs replacement. We gave him one lakh rupees. By the time he was in fourth year, he said, I need artificial leg again. And here is an invoice for two lakh rupees. 
I was a little worried. I had no experience of whether artificial legs are supposed to last three years or not. I sent him to an orthopedic surgeon. He said, yes, he needs a uh, new artificial leg and two lakh rupees is a reasonable budget. We gave him another two lakh rupees. Right? If we saw any student in any distress of any kind, we will give him. Two days back in Bangalore, one of the boys who's doing extremely well, he came up to the mic and he said, in my entire extended family, nobody had gone to class 11. When I came to IIT Kandahar to do my M.Tech, 8,400 scholarship, I was spending some money, but I was also sending home some money. And then IIT Kandahar sent me to Japan for one year. They even took care of my passport fees of 1,500 rupees. He said, I always felt that IIT Kandahar has my back. They took care of me at a very, very difficult time. Now today he's extremely well off. Right? So we give very liberal money to our students when it was needed. We give very, very liberal money for extracurricular activities. Once I got a very nice email from somebody from IIT Kharagpur saying we had this inter-IIT event where students are coming from different IITs and other IIT students are complaining that the uh, college was not able to give them train ticket and your students are the only ones that came by air and apparently IIT got paid for it. And what logic was, if you have to go to Kharagpur, train me kitna chahi lage ka, hai jase chala ga. Right? These are the kind of things that you can do if you have a lot of money. PhD students. 35% of PhD students of IIT Gandhi have spent one semester outside India. Very early, we said every PhD student is allowed to spend 2 lakh rupees for international travel outside conferences. 90% of our students are aware of that. Some of them go to two international meetings during the PhD stay. If any PhD student is not eligible for PhD scholarship because of certain government systems of having not gate exam and this and that, we will give the scholarships to them. All newly appointed faculty members are given top-up salary for the first three years. That's reasonably high. It's 40,000 rupees extra. Per month. More than 10% faculty members are on endowed chairs which gives them extra money for salary, extra money for professional expenses. Every faculty member can claim up to 1 lakh to 3 lakh rupees, depending on the some parameters for international travel, on top of whatever government is allowing. Some of the faculty members, we actually sent overseas for a semester. Somebody is getting burnt out, is doing too much administration. We said, Austin chala jai ek semester. We'll pay. Right? Uh, our board approved that any international visitor you want to bring for a month, two months, three months, director is authorized to give 100% matching from the donations. So I could give 2 lakh rupees from the government grant, another 2 lakh rupees from the donations, 4 lakh rupees. We said we need some good staff on deputation. We need an engineer in government departments who will maintain the buildings well. We want a clean, serious, hardworking officer. Why would he come to us? Government rules allow him 5%, 10% extra salary. It's not worth something. So our board said up to 30% extra allowance you can give to people coming on deputation from the donation money. We said any daily wager, any outsource worker, any worker in canteens of chai shops and whatever, anybody associated with the IIT Kandigar, if they have school-going children, we will give them 10,000 rupees per child per year as a school scholarship. If you go to IIT Kandigar's daily wagers, they will be very, very happy because if there's a medical emergency, we will write a check. One case, cancer case, we wrote a 3 lakh rupee check. Right? All that is possible to do good financial management and manage it well. But then that is not the only thing. We started a writing course. We said every student should learn writing because India has become very, very lopsided. JE exam, things like that, physics, chemistry, math, everything else doesn't matter. So we said every student, B.Tech, M.Tech, Ph.D., M.Sc., everybody has to do writing courses, just writing. And then one of our donors, he said, here is this Harvard professor who has now left Harvard, has created a company. And would you like this company to train your teachers on how to teach writing better? And he paid for it. Our teachers, our faculty members actually how writing courses can be done much better. Some of our US-based donors said, we went to this college in the United States, in New York, they are doing this wonderful thing called Invention Factory. Would you like to host it? We said, yes. 
20 students from different IITs come together for seven weeks. At the end of it, 10 patents are filed. These guys have mastered the art of taking BTEC students, second year, first year, third year, training them in six weeks to the level that they will file an Indian patent and a US patent. We did that. All the expenses were paid by our donors, but more importantly, we had no clue about this program. We have no connection with those professors. Right. Another of our donors said, I want IIT Kandira to teach learning by doing. Give a million dollars, create a maker bhavan, maker space where there is equipment, and that led to changes in curriculum. Uh, there was a gentleman based in Dubai who came and saw one of our students, uh, actually more than one student, they were doing this 3D printing of concrete. And he himself is a builder in Dubai. He's into real estate. I said, this is an interesting project. And he started to give money and mentoring to these boys. Some three, four weeks, five weeks back, Indian Army had a press item that said that uh, they will be <coughs> building bunkers with the uh, Chinese border in Arunachal Pradesh following the technology by this company, MyCorp. This is the company. They actually are building bunkers based on technology that our boys have created, which would not have perhaps been possible if that gentleman from Dubai had not been mentoring them and giving them money. What I'm trying to say is that this kind of engagement have far more far-reaching impact than what we can measure by money. Uh, every year at IIT Gandhagar, we do or used to do, they still are doing it after I left, an academic advisory council. We will bring American university presidents, other people for one full day, morning till evening, brainstorming across the table uh, on four key questions that I and my colleagues will start to see this is important. You know. The kind of questions we'll ask is, how do you promote faculty? The kind of question that we're asking is, how do you deal with PhD students having low aspiration? Things like that, academic questions. Uh, second day, we would do what is called leadership conclave, where we will say, how can we raise more money? How do we create new laboratories? Should we claim that we will be top 10 in the world? Should we claim we will be top 100 in the world? Things like that. And at the end of it, the advice to be will be, don't claim that you will be top 100 at IIT Gandhagar because you will not be. And you will be found to be untrue. You will not found to be authentic. But you can say that we are trying to build IIT Gandhagar to have systems and culture which is similar to the top 100 universities. Wow, that idea would not have come. And that became my sales pitch whenever I will go to people saying, I'm trying to imitate the culture and values and systems of top 100 universities. So there's a lot of value that comes in terms of critical advice from people. To me, one of the things that is most difficult about Indian academia is the lack of aspirations. Every time I was asked this question during my 12 and a half years at IIT Gandhagar, what is your biggest challenge at IIT Gandhagar? I used to say lack of aspirations. Lack of aspirations from my internal stakeholders, my teachers, students, and staff, but also lack of aspirations from my external stakeholders, the government, the community, the rest of the academia. They all think I will be like that. Nobody is thinking that I should be competing with Stanford and Caltech. Right? Let me show you some numbers that I collected on uh, <coughs> Wikipedia. I went to Wikipedia. I looked at how much the money Princeton has in its endowment and how many students it has, and it divided that number. Endowment divided by number. That gives me so many dollars Princeton has its endowment per student. Four and a half million dollars per student. Yale is having three and a half million dollars. Harvard 2.3, Stanford 2.1, MIT 2, Caltech 1.9. If this endowment, you use 5% of it, or actual expenses, it comes to a neat 80 lakh rupees to 1.8 lakh rupees per student per year. That is the kind of aspiration, if that is what you want to be in that league. Of course, this is a very unfair comparison because these are all private universities that have been raised with philanthropy. Their blood, their DNA is about raising money. They could not have survived without that. Right? So then I said, all right. How about the public universities? It is about one tenth of that, but still it is substantial. Right? 
uh, <clears throat> to me, the stakeholders in any university are not just the director or the teachers or the students, but everybody, the institutions like TFR, IC Bangalore, IIT, they belong to everybody. They all are, uh, you know, our heritage in some sense, and we need to protect that. Uh, <clears throat> this is my uh, very uh, favorite slide that our universities, our colleges tend to be very inward looking. And in order for us to do better, we need to be more outward looking. Uh, if this is a university, the circle is a university, everything inside the circle is the university. This university has faculty, staff, and students who are doing teaching and research for which they need facilities, infrastructure, and administration. And all our time is coming and going in handling this internal system. What is outside this is alumni, industry, government, society, NGOs, media, universities overseas, universities in India, foundations, donors, well-wishers. The nutrition for this inside ecosystem comes from outside. Where do you get the PhD students at IIT Gandhigar? You get it from IIT Bombay, you get it from IIT Rurki. You want to build relationship with Bombay and Rurki. Our students will come from NIT Hamirpur, build relationship with NIT Hamirpur. Where, are, where is the money coming from? It will come from government, from NGOs, from companies, from donors. Where will the ideas come from? From our friends in other places, right? So my contention is that if you were to become more outward looking for self-interest, not for doing philanthropy for others, I think it would be good for us. And that, I think, tension of internal versus external is very, very uh, real. We need to see how we can be more outward looking. Uh, and for that, institutions like TFR are in the best position because their internal systems are in so much in equilibrium that the leadership can actually spend more time outside. The more entropy is there inside, the more chaos is inside, more difficult it is for you to look outwards. So the better institutions are able to look outwards. Uh, this is perhaps my last slide. These are the major challenges that Indian academia has. Uh, first and foremost, the professionalism in dealing with external stakeholders. We just don't consider it important. We don't deal with the professional manner. I give you the example of spelling mistakes, but there's so many others. We will not apply to email. Somebody says, I'm willing to, I'm happy to come and give a lecture, or I'm happy to come. Can I use your guest house? We will not even reply. Delays in decision making. Somebody has said $2 million will be given, provided you put this auditorium in my mummy's name. And we take now three months, six months to decide that because our board is going to meet, our government will say something, you know, doesn't work. There was one time when we were getting delayed and a donor in US said to me, Sudhir, if what offer I have made to you, if I had made the same offer to an American university, their fundraising office will make sure that within one week, everybody signs the paper and my check is with them. If the fundraising office doesn't do it, they will be fired because I might change my mind. The stock market may crash. Something may happen. You don't lose opportunity when somebody is willing to give. There are a lot of implementation challenges. Somebody has given a scholarship, but the scholarship is never implemented. The scholarship has not been awarded for the last two years. <laughs> the scholarship is given to a second year student of MSc chemistry after the student is graduated. Because our scholarship committee doesn't meet frequently enough. Uh, we take the large money and we don't go back to them, address their concerns. And of course, one of the biggest challenges in Indian Academy is that faculty does not fully appreciate the value of this agenda. For them, it is a burden. At IIT Kanpur, that is what I experienced. When I went to IIT Kanagar, it was very important for me to build the faculty ownership and when I started to give money to uh, faculty for top-up salaries and this and that, it started to come. People, people saw that they're beneficiaries of it. Uh, their ownership improves. Frankly, fundraising is about fundraising. You become friends. In my case, uh, the kind of people I became friends with during my tenure for three years at IIT Kanpur Deanship, during my time of raising money for IIT Kanpur, they were very valued friends. They will do things for me, I will have very lifelong friendships with them. But actually, you don't start with money, you start with friendship. Thank you very much.
<laughs> yeah very nice lecture uh, very inspiring and very eye opening so the talk is now open for questions comments from the viewers also on the internet please raise your hand if you are uh, going to ask any question on the internet what does typically affect i mean is there a typical donor hmm. at least for somebody who has given money in the past is likely to give money more okay right so that is why uh, when american universities send you a ci get a mailer from caltech right so initially the mailer would have a form where i can take 50 dollars Hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. So first year I paid fifty dollars. Next year the mailer will be actually custom printed for me. It was seventy-five dollars, hundred fifty dollars, and three hundred dollars. And they will graduate me <laughs> from fifty dollars to seventy-five dollars to hundred dollars to two hundred dollars to five hundred dollars. Right? Mm -hmm. Typically, somebody who has been involved in philanthropy is more likely to be. That is why that pipeline is important. That is why you want people to get used to giving you money every year. Also, don't expect much money upfront. It will incrementally increase. First. Not always. Depends on who you are uh, dealing with. I had very, very pleasant experiences. You know, I had a experience where somebody <coughs> wrote me a tuta futa English uh, saying that uh, I want to set up a chair. And tuta futa English. I, I look at the name on the internet. I don't find anything, whatever. So I replied back. And uh, located your website, you are asking for 1.2 crore rupees. I'll give you. I'm worried. Who is this guy? Does he have a criminal background? <laughs> you know, <laughs> will I have egg on my face? Actually, did due diligence on him to the government of Gujarat before I took 1.2 crore rupees from him? He said, please come and visit. He said, we'll visit Badme Karlenge Pele Pese Lele. He gave me 1.2 crore rupees. Then and there. After one month, he and his wife came, very simple Gujaratis, uh, simple clothes, right? Later, I went and met them. Uh, his wife said, Aapne papa ke naam se chair kar diya, aapne mammi ke naam se kiya. So he said, Sudhi bhai, we have to do mammi ke naam se scholarship. I said, mammi ke naam se to scholarship nahi ho sakti. Jai papa ke naam se chair hua hai, to mammi ke naam se bhi chair hoga. Scholarship, I think I think I think I think I think Right? So we signed another agreement that IIT Kanagar will create two chairs and two scholarships in mummy's name, and gentleman will give more money for chair for mummy's name. Right? Later we said laboratory, one laboratory, second laboratory. He became one of our largest donors. Very simple guy, no connection, no IIT education. Right? His okay. parents were totally illiterate, farmers, believed in education. His brother became a doctor, settled in the United States, has created some fellowship for uh, doctors in the US uh, hospital system, whatever, in name of his daddy. And he said, Bhai ne wo kiya, hum bhi kuch kar dete. So there will be once in a while those kind of people. But your system is ready, your mechanisms are ready, your, your, you know, your antennas are receiving those signals. So I would not say that you uh, wait for, sometimes you don't want a small donation. If a very wealthy industry leader comes to me, right, and I see that there is a potential. See, see, America has now, in 2005, I paid a Chicago company $2,500. And I gave them the name and postal address of all my US-based alumni. And they created for me on internet a toolbox. And I can put your name, and the data will come based on publicly available data on what kind of house you own, what kind of political donations you have made, what kind of companies you are a director in, things like that. Whatever is publicly available. Then some empirical coefficients, they will multiply and they will say, this man, you should ask anywhere from $25,000 to $100,000. Or you can ask $5 million to $20 million, like that. They'll give me a range. So before I meet you, on my laptop, that is why I'm telling you, 2005 to 2008, I was a professional fundraiser, essentially. I would look on the internet and I will see what is your network before I go to your house. I will know that. Right? 
Now, if you are worthy of giving me a million dollar, I would not take ten thousand dollars with you. I will engage with you, have more cup of tea, meet you more often, and get you ready for a million dollar. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Lokesh. Yeah, I have a connection with that. There was one donor who was uh, <clears throat> who was very uh, he was not very happy with us, right? And we are asking for two million from him. So I met him over a coffee in a coffee shop in the United States, and I said, you know "What? I need to gain your confidence. I know you have some concerns. So I will come to you for two million dollars later. Today I am asking you hundred thousand dollars. Check me out. If you have confidence in me after hundred thousand dollars, we will discuss further." He said, "Fine, hundred thousand." Like, so sometimes you have to do that. You have to play the game. It is, it is, it is a you. After a while, you start to learn. It, you will have a lot of frustration sometimes. Right? Somebody will promise to you a chair, and he will back off. In my early tenure, first person promised a chair, backed off. Second person promised a chair, backed off. Third person promised a chair, backed off. I said something is wrong with me. Three people have promised chair, they backed off. So I wrote to one of our large donors in the United States, and I said. Something is wrong that I am doing. What is it? He said, "Let me get back to you." And he talked to some American fundraisers and okay. gave me more detailed analysis of the whole situation and what I should do. Be more careful in future. So the, 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 you will learn. You have will make mistakes. You will learn. Whether you want to do it or not, that is what you have to see. If you want to do it, you can do it. If I could do it, anybody can do it. Uh, little as one dollar. I have taken ten rupees. In in BHU, I have taken one rupee. BHU is a philanthropy based university. I joined there in January. On fifth February, I launched Pratidan Mahamanas University. We are seeking out money. Give us one rupee. The people who are giving one rupee and ten rupees, most welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, I have a slightly different question. Maybe partially I have already answered all this, but. See, IIT Gandhinagar is a relatively new, such a new, where all the well established older IITs are much more alumni base in mm -hmm. United States and all over the world. So, how did IIT Gandhinagar become so successful, being such a new institute having less alumni base? Hunger होना चाहिए, भूख लगी होनी चाहिए. I was hungry. I wanted my students to do better. I wanted my teachers to do better. I want to give my people more than what other IITs will give. Right? For that, I need money. If your stomach is full, you don't care so much. That is what I mean. Aspirations, right? You can say I am better than IIT X or IIT Y. Not good enough. You want to be better than Caltech, right? You can't be today, but at least aspiration can be there. Uh, so I have a comment to make. Uh, I am actually a previous student, passed out student of BHU. So since past two three years, <laughs> <there> was, <laughs> yes, I you know, participated in the Pratidan. Oh, no, I am so proud of you. Thank you. So till like two three years or so, there was no mail, nothing, nothing, nothing was coming. But like since the past years, I have been getting mails from uh, New Year, yeah, birthdays, yeah. everything, and it suddenly it's a very dramatic change I have observed yeah, in the. Yeah. Past one year, yeah, great work. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you for your donation to BHU. Uh, connect with all your friends and tell them that you met me, and yes. convey my message to them that they all have to send money. Hundred rupees is good enough. Yes, they sure. can do any other amount. Yes, sir. Ask a question on Zoom. Oh yeah, Zoom. Um, yeah, Professor. This is Deepan Ghosh. Professor Ghosh. Yeah. Uh, see, I, I wanted to ask you, of course, you talked about your experience in IIT Kanpur, which is an established institute, and I have seen you how uh, you worked in IIT Gandhinagar and created a system which was not there. But tell me, what is the challenge do you expect in something, some place like an university, which is you are in now, BHU? Uh, because University systems, unlike the IITs, uh, they were never geared to collect money from alumni, even though they have many more, much many number of alumni. I 
mean, do you expect a bigger challenge there? In fact, it was a ghost. Yeah. Uh, in university, there is a need for money much more because universities work with more rigid systems than IITs do. And uh, I don't see any difficulty in using money. I don't see any difficulty in creating an endowment. I uh, we follow the same rules of the game, uh, ATG, 100% tax deduction, and all that stuff. I don't think that is a problem for the university. I think the bigger problem is that we are very comfortable. We think we are Sarkari. Uh, Sarkar will take care of us, and we don't have to worry about it. That is what is the biggest problem. And our situation is that of that frog who is in a water, and the water is heating up slowly. The frog doesn't know that water is getting heated. Our universities are suffering. Thank you. I have, I have a technical question because you, you said that there are institutes that match up dollar to the dollar, for example. How does that work in Indian situations? Because how does, I mean, in a government situation where institute where every dollar, every rupee is accounted for under a, ta under a particular head, under what kind of head do you convince the institute to process so, this? In 1994, when government of India issued a letter to IITs, they said we will match dollar rupee to rupee. But they stopped doing that after two or three years. Number one. Number two, the way IITs work, uh, we are not a government institution. So our situation might be different from TIFR. We are a grant in aid institution. Government has no commitment to pay our salaries. The government, the law that was passed to create IITs, it says that the central government at its discretion, may give any funds that it may see deem appropriate to the institutions. So what does that mean? That means that during the year, I have collected money from rent, from tuition fee, from conference organization, whatever activities, 20 rupees. Government has given me 100 rupees. Now, if I spend 90 rupees, the 10 rupees I cannot take. But if I spend only 100 rupees and government has given me 100 rupees, the 20 rupees I can put in my endowment. Now, if government has given me 100 rupees, I spend 110 rupees, I still have 10 rupees left. That 10 rupees, my board can decide how you. So what we do is that money that we are able to save, if we are good. In IIT Kandigar, I was a pakka baniya in terms of, uh, uh, for example, rental income. Right. In one of the meetings, uh, I challenged other IT directors. I said, look at the bank rent that you are collecting. All the banks in typically government institutions, they are highly subsidized by us for rent. Our building, and they gave us peanuts. Why? They are commercial entities. They are charging them very, very heavy rent. So I was collecting a lot of money on rentals, on various other things. So I was able to put that money aside. Now my board authorized me that on chair, you can match up to 100% on a case-by-case -case basis. On a scholarship, you will always match 100%. So that resolution I took from the board for the next five years. So it has to be all legal. It has to be all proper, pakka. The worst thing that happens in fundraising is lack of ethics. You want to make sure that you don't do anything that will cause any doubt in the minds of people that you are doing something healthy. Thank you. Are there any questions, comments? Yeah. yeah. You were talking Rana. about this, uh, you know, when you initially got the donor from Gandhi Nagar, you were doubtful about this. So how do you address issues like this? You know, that at Ethics and uh, actually, and actually, what is, this gentleman is giving me one two crore rupees. He is not on the internet. His name is a very unique name. On the internet, it is no there. I asked him to come and visit. He says, "Koi jaldi nahi hai, baad mein kar lega." So I am a little worried that could there be a criminal background which will lead to disappear. That is what I meant a few minutes back. I said ethics. So I called the. Uh, Inspector General of Police of that area. And I said, we have this donor. Uh, could you just make sure that there is nothing? Uh, he said, give me a week. After a week, he called me. He said, of course, there is nothing. Don't worry. That's it. So you have to be a little careful. You don't want to take money from criminals. For it. it appeared to be too easy for me. So I was a little worried. 
All right. Yeah. Thank you. Have you ever? Ha- ah. I had just one question. Ah. Have you ever had a very annoying or insulting kind of? Out of them. Then how do you handle it? So one of the fundraising officers at Caltech taught me: you have to kiss hundred frogs before a prince arrives. <laughs> don't take personal. Uh, don't take this personally. If somebody misbehaves with you, insults you. You have to have a thick skin if you want to raise money. I went and met a gentleman in a major city in New York. No, in um, not New York, some other city in United States. Uh, wealthy person and uh, IIT Kanpur alum. And he said, we'll meet in such and such Indian restaurant for dinner, which is very nice, good sign. A rich person willing to meet me, spend time, that two hour dinner, it's a good sign, right? For next one and a half hour, it was a verbal diarrhea, complaining about IIT Kanpur, how bad it is. I was eating food and I was listening to imaginary and real both complaints and we shook hands and we never, you know, tried anything further. But there were also very interesting episodes. I went to meet this wealthy Indian in a five-star hotel in Delhi after fixing an appointment. We were having a cup of coffee and he said, there is no way I'm going to give you money because my passion is for girl student, girl children's education. And I'm raising money for girl students' education. I have these NGOs and there's no way I will give you money. I'm raising money. I said, this guy is not going to give me money. But he has a good cause, girls' education. I also feel strongly about it. So one of my donors who has given me a chair, he was in Delhi at the time, who also was passionate about girls' education. I called him. I said, do you mind if I bring a visitor to meet you? He said, Steve, you're most welcome. I told this guy, I said, I have this gentleman visiting from Washington, D.C., who is also interested in girl education. It is a little far off. It was like one hour drive, rush time. I said, would you come with me? He said, chalo. Instead of raising money for IIT Kanpur now, I'm driving with him to one hour to that gentleman's sister's house where he is. We meet, have a cup of tea, talk, all that. After that, I go my way, he goes his way. Some years later, this gentleman to whom we had gone to meet had a lunch with me, maybe after easily 10 years in Washington, D.C. And I said, he said, yeah, they're doing great work. I continue to support them. For next 10 years, this guy was supporting them. He was very happy and he was remembering that I had introduced him. So, wow. you know, you go beyond. You, you, you have to have a big heart, right? Don't think only for yourself. If you realize that this guy is not going to give you money, but he might give you for IIT Bombay, sure. They are a sister institution. That's really great. <laughs> okay, please give him a so thank you, Professor Jain. Uh, now, just to conclude the proceedings, the TI for Alumina Association is deeply uh, grateful to Professor Jain for accepting our invitation and to deliver this fourth Avig Goa Memorial Lecture. We remain thankful to uh, Dr. Simundu Goa and Mrs. Goa for ins- instituting this lecture series in memory of their son Avik Goa and giving us this opportunity to interact with leading intellectuals. Uh, I thank you all uh, sections of TIFR, particularly the lecture theater staff, uh, the canteen, the security staff and the security for their help in uh, successfully uh, setting up these proceedings today. And thank you all for being this wonderful audience and please join us for this uh, high tea outside. And thank you once again, sir, for coming here. Thank you very much.